a constant chorus that's being sung. And worthy is the God who has been slain for us. Amen. And we're here to celebrate that. So good to be with you, church. Welcome to the air conditioning. You're welcome. Little, little reprieve from the heat, right? This week was unusually warm, wasn't it? Yeah, but don't let it affect your attitudes, okay? You bought into this knowing full well what we had to offer in Arizona, right? So turn to Genesis chapter 5. Believe it or not, we're going to get through one full chapter this morning. God is a God of miracles indeed. Well, let's see, let's see how it goes. Let's just see how it goes, all right? Uh, thank you for your prayer for the Cornelius family. Um, I thought Ryan was going to mention when he called Kurt Cornelius one time. Uh, our favorite Roman centurion, Cornelius. Um, I spent time with the family yesterday planning his memorial, and there were a lot of tears, but there's a lot of laughter too. And so continue to pray for them as they grieve, as they mourn. There are stages to the grieving process that many of us don't understand, uh, but pray that God not only makes his presence known to them, but make sure you pray that his peace that surpasses all understanding will guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I pray that you can come out to the memorial on the 21st and remember his life. So uh, let's pray for them. Let's pray for our morning too. Father, thanks for meeting us in this time at this place. Thank you for your grace and mercy and all the treasures uh, that you give us spiritually in Christ. Pray for the Cornelius family as they continue to remember Kurt. Husband, father, friend, pray that you are glorified in this event. Lord, that you would be shown to be great and sovereign and incredibly merciful and loving. Surround that family with your arms, Father. Pray for our time as we navigate your word. Thank you for giving it to us. Pray you're glorified in all things. Pray this in Christ's name, amen. Genesis 5 is where we're going to be, 32 verses before us. And you know what? As a culture, I think you know you've arrived when Will Smith has a show that teaches you about the meaning of life. I mean, have we not made it as a civilization? I mean, who would ever thought the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air could tell us the meaning of our existence? If you don't know it, there's a show that's airing on Fox tonight called One Strange Rock. And it is a 10-part miniseries on how unique our world is. How unique the planet Earth is. And what's amazing about this show is that they, t they spend 10 episodes telling you how unique and how wonderful and how beautiful earth is, but there's one piece missing, God, right? Like if you leave God out of it, none of it is even worth talking about. As a matter of fact, if you leave God out of it, whether accidentally or on purpose, Without God, it loses all intrinsic value and meaning and significance. Why are we even talking about meaning if there is no God? If there's no God, then the discussion of meaning and significance is worthless. And so yet it is our world's attempt to try to make us feel something which is really vacuous without God. So, I mean, watch the show. Watch it and enjoy this one strange rock we all live on. But the ultimate search for truth and meaning can only get us so far without God. This is what's so remarkable about the word, right? This is so what's, what's remarkable about the Bible, the scriptures, is that it not only tells us about this one strange rock we live on, but it tells us more importantly about design and intelligence and meaning and why we are here and why we are here and what we're called to be as far as people. And this is what Genesis 5 reminds us of. That there is purpose and there is meaning behind it all. And so this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at this seemingly boring chapter. We're going to look at this, this chapter that most of us, when we start that whole, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year plan, we get to Genesis 5 and we say, I'm, I'm going to move on to something else. I mean, let's be honest, right? We all have great intentions at the beginning of the year saying, I'm going to read through the Bible in here. And we get to those genealogies, so-and-so begets, so-and-so. We're like, is this the road ahead of me? I've got better things to read. And yet, I'm going to present to you the case this morning, this morning that perhaps Genesis 5 
is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. Because in Genesis 5, you have the four main points of redemption history. In Genesis chapter 5, what we would continue just to kind of gloss over because we don't think there's anything pertinent or relevant there, we find the four key promises from God to us of what this is all about. So if Will Smith is watching via Facebook, Will, this one's for you. For those of us that are here who know God, may these truths be an encouragement for you this morning. Genesis 5 is given to you to encourage your souls. And for those of you who don't know God yet through Jesus, maybe this moves the needle a little bit in your life. My prayer is that you would know him, Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, who brings relevancy to all of this, to this one key truth that you were made to love God. And how do we know this? Because he loves you and has demonstrated in sending his son to die for you. Four main points we're going to look at this morning. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 5. Let's read through the whole chapter. I know. Maybe we should stand up so no one falls asleep, right? Genesis 5, starting at verse 1. And this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created a male and female. He blessed them and named them man in the day when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of his son in his own likeness, according to his image, and named him Seth. And the days of Adam after he became the father of Seth were 800 years, and he had other sons and daughters. And so all the days of Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. And Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. And Seth lived 807 years after he became the father of Enosh, and he had other sons and daughters. And so in the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. And Enosh lived 90 years and became the father of Kenan. And Enosh lived 815 years after he became the father of Kenan and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years and he died. You're starting to get a little bit of the, the message here in, in Genesis. Well, let's keep going. And Kenan lived 70 years and became the father of Mahalalel. Say that 10 times fast. And then Kenan lived 840 years after he became the father of Mahalalel. And he had other sons and daughters. So the days of Kenan were 910 years and he died. And Mahalalel lived 65 years and became the father of Jared. Jared! You made it in the scriptures, bro. I love it. And Mahalalel lived 830 years after he became the father of Jared, and he had other sons and daughters. So the days of Mahalalel were 895 years, and he died. And Jared lived 162 years. Don't get any hopeful thoughts from that, Jared, okay? And he became the father of Enoch. And Jared lived 800 years after he became the father of Enoch and had other sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. And Enoch lived 65 years and became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God. Whoa, something different, right? Breaking the narrative. 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah and he had other sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. And Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. And Methuselah lived 187 years, and he became the father of Lamech. When Methuselah lived 782 years after he became the father of Lamech and had other sons and daughters, so all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. And Lamech lived 182 years and became the father of a son. He named his son Noah. Well, there's a familiar name. Saying, this one shall give us rest from our work and from the toil of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. And Lamech lived 595 years. He became the father of Noah and had other sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Let me just start by saying this. We believe that every word is inspired by God. Okay, what I mean by that is you can write down the verse from Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture, all means all, and that's all all means, is inspired by God. God breathed 
for us because it is beneficial for teaching, equipping, encouraging, building up those who are God's sons and daughters. All scripture is given to us by God. So the question is, how does this mean anything to our lives? So-and-so was born, lived so many years, had kids, died. And this is repeated 10 times. It's here for a reason. And I want to note just a couple interesting things that are going to help us guide us in our, our study of this chapter. Notice their careful concern about details for every single person listed here. So-and-so was born to this person. They lived this long. They had other kids. And the total number of their years was this many. And these all follow the same formula. Now, what's interesting is last week we looked at the line of Cain. And the line of Cain, he had kids, but the difference between Cain's line and then this line we're reading today is that you don't have total number of years lived. You don't have kids born to that line. You don't have, they live this total number of years. There's not the importance of the details of life given to Cain. Why? Because Cain chose to live his life without God. There's no eternal history with Cain's line. God says, if you do not live for me, you will not matter. But when you live for me, you will be remembered. When you live for me and you live a righteous life, because that's what Genesis chapter 5 gives us. It gives us this righteous line of Adam where these men, these families live for God, and God says, when you live for me, I will remember you. And not only your names will be written in his book, your deeds will be written down as well. Look at Malachi chapter 3 sometime. Look at Revelation chapter 20. These things are clear. When God is honored in your life, he will honor you. Wow. This is incredibly rich because what it says is that you may feel infinitesimally small. You may feel insignificant. I mean, you are one person in a current world of 7 billion plus. But when you love God, he knows you singularly. He knows you by name. He knows what makes you tick. He knows how you're wired. He knows every hair on your head. And for some of you, you lost a lot of those this morning in the sink. And God knows everything about you. And for the person that says, I want to honor God, God says to you, you who honor him, he will honor you and you will be remembered. Though the world may see you as trivial, though the world will see you as significant, God says, when you're for me, I'm for you. And this is why this genealogy is important. This is a righteous line of men and families who said, I want to live for God. We want to live for God. And so this is an important setup for us as we navigate these four key truths I want you to look at this morning. Notice how it opens in, in verse 1. These are the, this is the book of the generations of Adam. That phrase, this is the book of, appears 10 times in Genesis. And it's giving us clear lines of demarcation of important themes that are going to happen in Genesis. This is the second time that phrase pops up in verse 1. The first time it pops up is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, where it says, this is the book of the heavens and the earth. See, Genesis opens with saying, in the beginning was God. God always was, God always is, God always will be. He is the eternal, uncaused cause, the, the, the creator of everything we see around us. He himself being the uncreated one. And the book of Genesis starts with the assumption that God is and then he creates the heavens and the earth. And so God sets this up to say the divine stage is, is set up before man is even created. Men and women in his image. But now we have book two start right here in verse five where it says these are the generations of Adam. Now God is going to go into a full scale explanation of why you're here. 
And when you live for him, there are promises from God that I'm going to unpack here in this passage that have to do with us as humanity. And this is key. First point is this. When we talk about Adam, we are talking about the promise to those who exist. Your existence is proof that there is a God. And it's not only proof that there is a God, but there is a God who has endowed every single person that has ever existed, exists today, or will exist tomorrow, that there is something unique about us as humanity. That no other creation is like men and women. We are set apart from the rest of the created world. You are supremely more significant than the animals you look at at the zoo and the things you watch on your favorite National Geographic show about all your favorite animals and even the manatees. I know that's hard to accept, but that's that's reality. That human beings are different because the Bible says you are the only creation created in the image of God. The Latin is imago Dei. You bear the mark of God in your life. And every single person that has ever been born into existence has this mark indelibly stamped upon their life. No man, no woman can escape this marking. You are created with eternity in your soul. You exist in Acts 17, Paul says, in him you live and move and have your being. And no man and no woman has ever escaped the reality that there is a supreme being. There is a God and that eternity is set apart in us. And that's different from the rest of creation. And I want you to know that you, simply because you exist, are created in God's image, and you are important. And yet our mentality today would be like, you know, God is only for those who are super nice or, or super rich or, or super powerful. I mean, I saw this image this week in, in the news. I don't know if you caught this, but there's a church in Indiana that thought they put a fence around the Holy Family. And I think this is, you know, and I'm going to tell you right now, this was the church's way to say we are anti-Trump in his immigration policy, Right? You know, but yet if we really consider the the narrative of Christmas, Joseph and Mary were refugees. They were immigrants. Jesus was born in a foreign land. Thank goodness there wasn't those policies back then. Amen. But yet I look at this and I sit there and go, how many people look at this and could also see in this the message that, you know what? Jesus is unapproachable. You've got to have a lock and, and key to get in key to the lock or we may look at this and say jesus is protected from us and i sit there and go you know we all kind of know the kind of people we are and go why would god want to have anything to do with me and i think the reminder to adam and the promises the fence between us and and jesus is removed the barrier is gone the wall is torn down jesus came for the sick jesus came for the downtrodden Jesus came for the immigrant. He came for the alien. He came for the stranger. He came for people like us who sit there and go, I don't deserve it. And God says, I know you don't deserve it, but that's exactly why I'm a God of grace. I'm going to give to you what you don't think you deserve because I want you to feel the measure of how important you are because you are created in my image. And so the promise to Adam This is the guy who disobeyed God outrightly. He rebelled against God's will. Here's the message that you exist and there is the possibility of you being loved by God. You just need to accept his love. He knows you through and through, which is kind of a scary thing, right? We come into a place like this and it's easy to put up the facades. Be like, oh, I'm good. I got my latte, got my Bible. I'm ready to meet Jesus, right? And we don't connect with anyone because we have this fear that people are going to know us as we truly are. I'm going to tell you right now, you need to be secure in your own skin because there's a God who knows you and still loves you. Amen? There's a God who says you exist and you exist for me. 
You exist for no other reason than to know me. And I'm going to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, that you are unique. The ability that you have to love beauty and abstract, have abstract thinking and have these emotions and have this moral consciousness, you are unique. But you have to start with God if you're ever going to discover meaning for your life. Can I just tell you right now, there's a couple commercials I totally hate on TV right now. And they communicate the same message. You do you. You guys know this? Right? There's the casino in town that has the billboards up there. You just do you. And then there's a Diet Coke commercial, and it's the same message. I'm going, what are we embracing as a culture? No, don't do you. Because if you do you, and all 7 billion plus people choose to do them, then we've got life going in 7 billion different directions, and none of them are good. You do God. And you use that as a jumping off point. Now we're talking about singular purpose and value and significance. Because here's what happens. You do you, you're still unfulfilled. You do you, you're, you're still unsatisfied. You do you, there's still lack of contentment. You do God, now we're getting somewhere. You do God, now you're going back to the creator and he holds direction and he holds instruction and he holds purpose for you we go to god and say i'm gonna do god and i'm gonna start to discover meaning for my life we wonder why we wonder why people continue to buy into these lies because we refuse to start with god this is the promise to adam you start with god and understand your existence now we are cooking with gas amen so here's adam he shows up he gives birth to a, a boy named Seth, which is the promise that God will deliver, right? There was hopefulness in Seth's birth that there will be a righteous line. Because you go back to Genesis 3, the promise of a deliverer would come through the line of Adam and Eve. Well, with Cain, I'm sure they're scratching their heads going, man, we're really, really lost on this whole thing. What's God doing? Because Cain is not righteous. Well, there's another righteous line that's established through the birth of Seth. And Adam lives 930 years. 800 of those years, he was witnessing the impact of his sin in the culture. Now think about this. Boy, I tell you what, it's one thing to disobey God and to feel it inside. It's another thing to disobey God and see the impact on the lives around you. He lived 800 years watching a culture just fall into the moral abyss. And yet, he died knowing that the promise would be fulfilled through the righteous line of Seth. And you can trace back the genealogy of Jesus to this line. Even though this, that Seth would not be the deliverer, that there would be one who would deliver that would come through this line. God is true to his promise, and he did promise a deliverer. Second point is this. So then Seth gives birth to a son, and he names him Enosh. Now, we met Enosh last week. If you go back to chapter 4, look at verse 26. And Seth also had a son, called him Enosh. And then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Why is Enosh's birth so important? Well, start with his name. His name literally means frail or weak. And what his name communicates to us is that while we are human and we're created with the imago Dei, the image of God stamped indelibly upon our lives, we do not have the ability to do what God wants us to do. We are frail and weak people. But all is not lost because where we are weak, God is strong. Amen? And so what we have here in Genesis is this name Enosh reminding us of our frailty and our weakness but when you call upon the name of the Lord, there is healing. There is an answer. There is strength. There's a way out. And this is amazing that at the birth of Enosh, it's at his birth that men and women and families started to call upon the name of the Lord. And so whereas Adam communicated us this idea of our existence, this message through Enosh is that the promise is to those who call. The Bible says, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be 
saved. See, you have to embrace the love of God through Jesus Christ. You have to believe, you have to trust, you have to call. Just because you're born in America doesn't automatically mean you're in as a Christian. Right? There's a lot of people who think that, right? American equals Christian. No, it doesn't. It is when your heart realizes that you are frail and weak and that you cannot do anything, you call upon the name of the Lord and his strength is more than sufficient to save you. And this is the message of Enosh, that the promise is to those who call. And so what we have is this genealogy. Enosh lived. He gives birth to kids and has a family. Men begin to call in the name of the Lord. And we're starting to see the spiritual trajectory change in this narrative. And men and women are calling upon the name of God. And I'm going to tell you right now that they're still doing that to this day. That there are men and women even right now that are calling upon the name of the Lord for the very first time. Is that not remarkable or what? Do you remember the first time you called upon the name of the Lord? You know when it was for me? August 15th, 1985. When I realize that I fall short of God's glory, that the wages of sin is death, and there's no way out but Jesus. And on August 15th, as a 15-year-old boy in North Scottsdale, I bowed my knee and accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior in my bedroom. And something remarkable happened. Eternal life took root. And I started realizing that this world is not about me, and my life is not about me. I am now called to live for Jesus. That's what happens when you call upon the name of the Lord. And then you begin to understand the value of eternity. And then the words of Maximus from Gladiator, right? What we do echoes for all eternity is so important. Any Russell Crowe Gladiator fans out there? Okay. Who's never seen Gladiator? Either you're all lying or there's just a couple truth tellers here. I mean, what you do echoes for all eternity. And whatever is done for Christ will ultimately last. See, there's an invitation right now for those of you to call upon the name of the Lord. Will you accept the invitation? I'm going to tell you right now, I saw a great video a couple months ago. There's this group called Yes Theory. Is anyone familiar with Yes Theory? So they are about, they're four guys, and they're YouTube celebrities. And what they do, and here's their motto. You ready for this? Seek discomfort. Seek discomfort. And you're sitting there going, okay, what is this all about? So these guys set out and they do things that are going to take them out of their comfort zone. And they realize that the choice they make to get out of their comfort zone actually turns out to be such a rewarding experience. Like, for example, they hung out with a six-year-old kid for 24 hours and gave him $10,000. And whatever the six-year-old kid wanted to do, that's what they did. So one of their videos, I'm going to encourage you to watch it so you can YouTube it. Yes Theory. They throw a party where they invite total strangers over. And how they get the strangers is they post the event on Craigslist, Tinder, and Bumble. Now, they walk the streets and they pulled people. They said, would you attend a party that was advertised on Craigslist? And people were like, no way! Like, they're sitting there going, yeah, I'm, I, like, I want to have my organs harvested by to- some total, yeah, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. So what happens in this video is they post this party on Craigslist, Tinder, and Bumble, and they start getting calls from random people. Hey, we're interested to come to your party. They did this big blow-up castle for the backyard. They get all this food catered in. And I'm going to tell you right now, all these total strangers show up to this house in L.A., And in the end, it turns out to be the most glorious event of people not knowing each other gathered to celebrate life. And they sit there and go, why do we live in a society that just seems so fragmented and so disconnected? And what if we just invited total strangers in and we we end up having so much in common? There's young people, there's old people, there's black people, there's white people. There's all these people at this party, and they're, they're, they're just there to have connection and to celebrate. And I sit there and go, what a picture of the kingdom of heaven. What a picture that God says, I'm throwing a party, and it's going to be epic. There's going to be bounce houses, and there's going to be food, and everyone is invited. 
and you don't have to look a certain way, and you don't have to act a certain way, and you can dress however you want. If you want to come like the village people, come like the village people. If you want to look like Will Smith, come look like Will Smith. If you want to look like the naked cowboy that sings in New York City, come like the naked cowboy. But however you want to come, come and find acceptance and find love. And I sit there and go, that is an invitation to the kingdom of heaven through Jesus Christ. Amen? God invites people into his party every single day. And Jesus says in Luke 15, when one person takes up the invitation, there is a party that erupts in heaven. The angels rejoice. God says, welcome home. You are loved and you accepted more than you would ever imagine. And we sit there and go, it is hard to believe that I could be loved like this. That's the promise of God through Jesus. That he knows you through and through. He accepts you as you are. He invites you to the kingdom party. And now you have a seat at the table. And we sit there and go, glory be to God. Hallelujah. He is good. Amen. That's the promise through Enosh. That those who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We are desperate for God. And without his invitation, if you ignore it, you're not invited. And we wonder why people miss out on the party. It's why? Because righteousness does not run in our blood. Corruption does. And we think that this, this, is, too good, this is too good to be true. The message of Jesus is too good to be true. And Enosh will testify to the fact that it's not. Well, it is, but it's not. That God loves you as you are, where you are. Accept the invitation. Number three. We look at Adam and the promise to those who exist. We look at Enosh, there's the promise to those who call. Now look how we carry on this theme. Now there's the promise via Enoch to those who walk. And again, these are themes that really embrace the entire narrative of the Bible. There's humanity, there's the calling out for salvation, now there's the walk. What does God expect of me if I call upon him, come to the party, I'm at the table, I now know Jesus. What is expected of me is now that you walk with God. Write that phrase down, walk with God. Look at Enoch, verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years, became the father of Methuselah. Enoch, walk with God, circle that in your Bible. 300 years after he became the father of Methuselah. So notice this. He walks with God 65 years after his son's born. He doesn't know God. And in his 60s, he comes to know God, and he finishes out his life 300 years walking with God. Is it ever too late to embrace Jesus? Never too late. If you're 65 years old here today and you don't know Jesus, it is not too late to embrace Jesus. Amen? If you're 85 years old, I don't know if there's anyone 85, but if you're 85, it's not too late. If you're 35, it's not too late. If you're 15, it's not too late. And yet this man walked with God for 300 years. There's only one other person in scripture where that description walked with God is attributed to, and that's Noah. Only two men in the Bible that says they walked with God. It is Enoch and it is Noah. This doesn't mean they were perfect. This doesn't mean that spiritually they batted a thousand. These men made mistakes. They had a track record. They were forgiven. They were loved. And yet what we need to understand is that the Bible tells us about this character Enoch. This man Enoch who walked with God. And I want to point out a couple other places that his name's mentioned because this is going to help us unpack a little bit of his biography. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. Here's what it says. By faith Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death and he was not found because God had taken him. So we see in Genesis that this was one of two characters in the Bible that never physically died, the other one being Elijah. Two men where God said, I'm going to just remove you from the earth. We don't know why God did that, but he did it. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Why did he please God? Because he walked with God. We'll talk about that here in a bit. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So number one thing we see here in this passage is that 
Enoch believed God exists, and because God exists, and you exist in his existence, that therefore gives your life meaning. We've already talked about this. But secondly, Enoch knew something that he wants to tell us today. God rewards those people. God rewards those men and women who walk with him. Notice, God rewards those who seek him. The question is, how do we seek God? And it's not a seeking to discover him for the first time, and that is critically important. The moment you are saved, right, you call upon the name of the Lord, and he delivers you, he saves you, he rescues you. But there is a seeking of God that ought to happen in every single one of our lives as believers in Christ. Especially in a culture that seems so anti-God. And this is where Jude carries the narrative a little further with Enoch. Jude chapter uh, actually, there's no chapter. There's one chapter, verses 14 and 15. It says this. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment on all to convict the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against. There's a lot of ungodliness in this, these verses, right? But here's the message Enoch preached in his culture that there are men and women choosing to live life apart from God. And so Enoch became this prophet in his generation. He became this preacher in his generation, and his message to the people in his culture was, turn from your wickedness and embrace God. Turn from your selfishness and embrace God. Live for God. Walk with God. This is the only way. And how true is this message for us today? As we encounter a world that continues to live in ungodliness and chooses ungodly pursuits, how much is the presence of the church's testimony to say, love God, embrace God, walk with God, so critically important? So what does this say to us in our lives today? There's four things I want to unpack for you when it comes to walking with God. And as you know, I'm a a fan of alliteration, so they all begin with the letter F. Today's message is brought to you by the letter F. It is a life of friendship. It is a life of following. It is a life of fellowship. And it is a life of forsaking. This is how you walk with God. This is the the bare bones reality of if you want to follow Jesus, And in a sense, embrace the message of Christ, which he says, if you're going to be my disciple, what do you have to do? You have to you have to deny yourself. You have to take up your cross and you have to follow him. Well, here they are in four points. Here we go. Number one, it's a life of friendship. When you walk with God, you are now in friendship with God. Here's what's beautiful about the scriptures is that the Bible says you were once enemies to God, but because of Jesus, you've been now made friends. What? Like, who's your buddy? Who's your BFF? It's Jesus. This is why in John 15, Jesus turns to the disciples and says, now I call you friends. Can you think of a more endearing title for our relationship with, with the Savior, with the Lord, the King, then, then they hear him say, you're my friend. The Bible says that the wall of hostility in Christ has been torn down, and because of Jesus, there's no separation between you and God. You who were once far off in Ephesians chapter 2 have now been brought near. You're his friend. And what do friends do? They hang out together. Friends spend time together. Friends say, you know what? I want to spend every waking moment with you. I want to hang out with you. You're a delight to be with. I think of friendships like with my kids. And I love my son, Addison. And here's what I love about Addison is that when someone comes to the door from the neighborhood, he runs to the door so fast, opens it because more than likely it's one of the neighborhood friends. And Addison will drop everything. Even a game of Fortnite to play with his friends. And I sit there and go, man, 
how eager am I to spend time like that with somebody? How eager am I to spend time like that with Jesus? Where if Jesus ever rang the doorbell, I drop, I open, I sit there and go, yes! Throw on my shoes, and I'm out the door saying, what are we going to do? Right? That's what friendship does. It compels you to say, nothing is more important than this relationship. So the life of friendship, number two, it's a life of following. Because what is so wonderful about this friendship is that you know who the leader in the relationship is. And if you have not discovered that yet, you will soon discover this. Who's the boss? It's not Tony Danza. It's Jesus. That's an old cultural reference. I'm sorry, guys. Some of you are like, who? Tony who? Forget about it. The reality of it is this. We say we love Jesus and know him as Lord, but lordship implies someone who's calling the shot. He sets the course. He says, this is the direction we're going to go in. See, the question sometimes of, of a disciple in Jesus is, who are you following? I mean, he's making it clear where he wants you to go. Now, are you following him? Because if you're not following him, if there's no followership, there's probably no discipleship. Ooh, that's a good tweet. Tweet that out, somebody, right now. <laughs> Scott Morgan said, if there's no followership, there's probably no discipleship. And this means this, when you follow, it means someone else is leading. And if God is leading and you're following, then you're walking with God. God must take the lead. And when God heads in a direction, you head in that same direction. When God says, we're going to make a turn, you make that turn. We are to keep in step with God. And the only way I know to keep in step with God is to make sure the compass of where God is, because sometimes it's hard to know where God is. I'm going to tell you right now, you'll always know where God is when you use the compass of his word, when you use the compass of prayer, and when you use the compass of the Holy Spirit at work within you. And if you neglect any one of those three things, you may not be in step with God. You see how important following is? God is clearly leading. Now, whether you're in the pack or not depends on, are you using the compass of the word? Are you using the compass of prayer? And are you using the compass of the internal work of the Holy Spirit? Because it is those three things that are going to keep you in step with God. Amen? Some of you are like, man, I've been lost this week. And I've been lost before. And being lost is not fun. And as a man, you don't ask for directions because we're too prideful, right? But when it comes to God, all of us get our bearings a little bit off. We always end up someplace going, I don't know where I am. And I'm going to tell you right now, those three things, the word of God, prayer, and the Holy Spirit will always bring you right back into lockstep with God. He's leading. Are you following? Number three, fellowship. It's a life of fellowship. Meaning, through the word, through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, you're enjoying your time together. Now, I'm not going to say that sometimes in the enjoyment of your time together, there's not wrestling and there's not struggle. I mean, when I first met Lori, and all of a sudden my heart started developing affections for her, she was all I could think about. Have you ever had a relationship with somebody where it was like every waking moment, like the moment you wake up, it's like, I wonder what Lori's doing. You go to bed and go, I wonder what Lori's doing. And you call everyone, hey, what are you doing right now? Where are you at? Can we spend time together? Can we get together? Are you, are you busy for lunch? Can we go see him? Like, right? Like, you just want to be around that person because you have found a relationship that has so gripped your heart that you couldn't think of a waking moment apart from that person. And here we are 26 years later, and we still have those affections, right? Like right now during the summer, our only criticism is how come school hasn't started yet because we miss our date days together. School equals free babysitting, right? Free childcare, right? Our kids are in school. We need to go hang out and go see a movie. We miss that. We're talking about, we're like, oh, can't wait for school to start. Why? So we can have our date days once again. But it doesn't mean that when we have our date days that there's things that we don't talk about that are not important. 
Sometimes we talk about things that are serious. Sometimes there's things we have to wrestle through together. But that doesn't change the affection that I want to have fellowship. I want to be in community. I want to have relationship with her. May that be never more true than for God, ladies and gentlemen. May every moment be a a moment where you're going, I'm going to seize this opportunity for where's God in this? What's God saying? What's God wanting to do? How can I meet God? How can I discover God? It is a pursuit. It is a fight. It is a battle. Because there's so much in our world that's trying to woo us away from that. And Enoch would tell you, in the midst of an ungodly culture, walk with God. This is your only saving grace, is to have a relationship with him. And know that he wants to have a relationship with you. And so may your fellowship be sweet. May your interactions on a daily basis be sweet with him. And like I said, use the word, use prayer, use the internal work of the Holy Spirit, because those are the things that develop intimacy. Those are the things that help you pay attention. When you are in agreement with him, whether you like it or not, right? Because he is the one who knows best, which leads us to the fourth point. It's a life of forsaking. I do not know a man and woman or woman of God who has not walked with God and left things behind. God has this amazing way of just stripping things from your life. And then, and that's the hardest thing. I mean, the struggle of wanting something so much that your grip is so tight around it, and God's sitting there going, let me pry your fingers, right? And those of us know the pain of having that grip removed by the power of God But when you lose something that you thought you needed so desperately, and yet God says, you're going to do better with me without it, it takes time for you to discover, yeah, that was blessed subtraction that did happen in my life. God took something that I thought was important away in order to prepare me for something greater with him. And that's what God does. He calls us to forsake things. He calls us to forsake relationships and possessions, and careers, and hobbies, and things that may not be inherently evil, but they are things that are robbing you of fellowship with God. And you may be feeling that pry right now on your fingers. Anyone's, anyone's finger joints hurt a little bit this morning? Just curious. Where God's saying, you don't need this. You need me. You don't need that. You need me. And so many times we try to find value and significance in the things we possess, and we miss out that value and significance is found in the things that possess you, namely God. It's a life of forsaking. That's why Jesus said, Luke 9, 23, if anyone wishes to be my disciple, let him deny himself, Take up his cross, an instrument of death where you're crucifying yourself, and follow me. It's what we call blessed subtraction. That naked you came into the world, and naked you're going to go, and all the things you thought you needed, you didn't. The only thing you did need was God. Enoch knew this. He walked with God, and he knew that God rewarded those who seek him. And I want you to know this truth today. That there is not just a calling on your life, but there is a day-to-day walking that God says, I want you to enjoy. And when you don't walk with him, may you feel the vacancy of what should be there. And may that hunger and thirst compel you to go back to him, right? Psalm 42, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. And Psalm 73, right? There is nothing in heaven and nothing on earth that will satisfy me, God, outside of you. You are my all in all. Amen? A couple verses to write down. Ephesians 5, 8, you're to walk as children of the light. Galatians 5, 16, you're to walk in the spirit. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, you're to walk worthy of God. How walking is such a metaphor of our lives as Christians. Walk with God. Enjoy his friendship. Enjoy his presence. 
Enjoy the ways he's speaking to your life. Enjoy the plan that he's got for you because the promise is this. He will be with you. He'll never forsake you. He'll never leave you. He will be your constant companion for all eternity. Woo! Last point. Lamech. Not to be confused with Lamech of Cain's lineage. So there's a second Lamech, and I'm only going to use this as a jumping off point into our discussion next week. He gives birth to a son named Noah. And we're familiar with Noah, and we'll spend several weeks talking about Noah because it's such an important narrative. Noah's name literally means comfort. Because what Lamech experienced in his culture was that there is a culture, there's a generation that is living apart from God, and it is cursed because of sin. And Lamech knew the promise that God would send a deliverer, and he sees his son as part of that promise, and so names his son Noah, which means comfort. And so what Lamech promises is that there is hope. See, the first Lamech in Cain's line was known for his arrogance. This Lamech of Seth's line was known for his yearning. And can I just tell you right now, the one thing outside of a walk with God that's going to get you through this life is a yearning for the world to come. That Romans 8, where Paul says, with like outstretched necks, we are longing for the world that is yet to come. All creation moans. All creation groans. We are seeking a better life. And God says, it's not going to be found here, but will be found in the hereafter. It's that which we long for. And I tell you, I had two conversations with Kurt before he died. And the yearning in his speech was present. I called Kurt and was talking to him on the phone. I said, Kurt, buddy, I love you and I'm praying for you. And here's what Kurt told me on the phone. I have a Savior who has loved me and has forgiven me of my sin. And he's got a plan and a future for me. And that's where my hope is. And I said, there you go. You got it, man. You're right on. You're going to finish well, my friend. And the second time I saw him in person, when he could barely move from his chair, he said the same thing. He said, Jesus has saved me. He has forgiven me of my sins. And he's preparing me to have an eternal home with him. And I said, that's it. And when you're with someone who's preparing to leave this world and enter the next, and you hear that hope, it doesn't mean there's no pain. Kurt would tell you that he was wrestling. He's wrestling through the mental anguish of what's happening. He's wrestling through the spiritual anguish of what's happening. And I sit there and go, that's real. And that's, that's, that's something that is present. And boy, I didn't even know what he was going through. But I told, I told him and I told his family, and I'm telling you today, that his hope was secure because he had Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, ladies and gentlemen, when you have hope like that, this world can throw anything at you, even cancer. And you know that this will one day be gone, and one day you will stand in the presence of God, and you are His forever, disease-free, sin-free, cancer-free, pain-free, grief-free, mourning-free. You fill in the blank. You're free! And when Jesus sets you free, you are free indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Kurt died well. Kurt had Jesus. And I'm going to tell you right now, for anyone that has Jesus, there is relief, there is rest, there is comfort. Because he himself said, I am the resurrection and the life. Though you may die, when you have me, Jesus says, you will yet live. Who's excited about that? I tell you what, if I only had a kernel of the hope Kurt had, I'm going to be okay. If you have Jesus, you have hope. May God continue to develop that yearning within each and every one of us.
because this world will come to an end and then eternity will be set in motion. And my question is, do you know him? Will you be a part of God's party? Will you be a part of his household? Because anyone who calls upon the Lord, the Bible says, you will be saved. How do we wrap our minds around some of this yearning, some of this hope to come? Write down these verses, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I think I have these on the screen. Let's just look at a couple of these real quick. How are we doing on time? Oh, man. Okay, go for it. I think I heard the Holy Spirit talking back there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This, these are the things that ought to guard our hearts and our minds when we don't know what tomorrow holds. We're a little uncertain. We get a little stressed or anxious. Look at how the scripture says, have hope. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Paul continues and says, He who has prepared for us this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Why is the Holy Spirit important? Because the Holy Spirit is God's earnest deposit that what he has promised you, he will come through on as sure as he is a truthful, trusting God. So we are always of good courage. There's always hope for we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. Then Paul, in another place, Philippians chapter 2, says these words. He says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. For I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful and labor for me, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. For to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Paul understood the tension. He is facing death. He will soon be beheaded for his faith. But he knows as long as I live, I'll serve the Lord. But there is a hope and there's a guarantee for me in the future that I am desiring. And then there's another place in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Great passage. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where's your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And our hope is this, as sure as Jesus has risen from the dead and is now seated at the right hand of the Father, we can be a people who have the most incredible hope of anyone in the world. Why? Because we know him who has been risen. We know him who has been victorious, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Don't tell me Genesis 5 doesn't mean anything. Don't tell me God is not important. Don't tell me God does not have a plan for each and every one of us. Don't tell me God has ever shirked on his promises. He is a God to not only be trusted, he is a God to be adored and worshipped. Walk with him today. Walk with him forever. Amen? Let's stand, let's pray. Father, thank you for meeting us in this time and this place. Lord, this is such an important start of our week. You've given us this time together to be reminded of how important a walk with you truly is. For those that have not started the journey, may today be this day of salvation for them. May they start the journey with Jesus. And for those of us that are on the journey that may be distracted here and there, help us to keep our eyes on the prize of the upward calling in Christ Jesus and let us lay aside everything that is trying to trip us up so that we may run this race with endurance for your glory and for our good. Thank you for loving us in Jesus, Father, and for our time together today. Be glorified in everything we do and say. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face towards you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Meet someone you've never met before and have a great day. God bless.
Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.